two slides, came up with the 10,000 hours rule. And that's like very catchy, right? It's a number, it seems very large, it seems to be like, oh, if I do something for 10,000 hours, I'll become an expert. But that's just pure quantity. It doesn't really dive into quality. So Thomas Erickson said, well, what does quality practice look like? And how do experts become great at what they do, not through just sheer number of hours, but through uh, approaches and methodology? So the, my, my thought in talking with some good friends of mine who are really big into deliberate practice, I thought, well, military talk about deliberate practice, to my knowledge, is talk about a deliberate practice of score study. I was not mean to apply these principles in a way that you can score study more effectively, efficiently, and be able to, especially as your schedule is becoming more busy once you go out and become professionals, and then maybe personal obligations to increase as well, as about being very efficient. Dr. Peterson mentioned something um, in the Q&A, like with the participants, and someone asked about score study. The question always comes up at symposia. And he, uh, one of his big views, what here is the strength of teaching, he was a long time uh, conductor at New England Conservatory, and he said something that great, no, I, Mr. Fatisi, I'm not on a first name basis with Mr. Fatisi, <laughs> I've never met the man. But something he said Mr. Fatisi did a lot is, when he's like, oh, I have 10 minutes, I'm going to score study. Whereas I think oftentimes we, we approach it or we come in with maybe a preconception that score study has to be, you know, as Dr. Peterson puts it, lighting the incense, like, you know, getting your Ouija board out, communing <laughs> with the spirits, and I need four hours to take this. That certainly was my thought when I was first getting into sports study. I thought I needed to block out hours of time, have perfect light, and then light concentration, and then the wisdom would just flow through. Not the case. So this idea that um, effective use of time is a hallmark of any high-achieving professional, I have no idea what I hyperlink, so if you click on that, you will get to find out. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. But just as, as you go through your not only your schooling, but as you start entering your career, you'll find that just, I want to talk about time management. But, in, but it's more than just coming up with a schedule, which I'm sure many of y'all are great planners and great schedulers, but it's just learning how to be efficient. Like, not just time blocking, oh, I, I take an hour to do this, but like, oh, I can actually, if I work really efficiently, get this thing done in 15 minutes, 30 minutes, instead of blocking out a whole hour. So that's just something to consider from professional development side of stuff. And to be honest, your current schedule right now is pretty conducive to starting to learn deliberate practice because I mean, even though your days are pretty well planned out with classes and rehearsals and professional development, social time and sleep on occasion, like <laughs> um, chances are you probably have like, like random short chunks of time where you have downtime between activities. And that's really what it's like in the pro world. Like um, when I was teaching, um, I told you it was from 9.05 to 4 o'clock, and then during the fall, went over to marching band, had that until 6.30, and then I was done. But during the day, I would have like random blocks of time, just like sit down and write an email, or sit down and create these assignments, and you just learn how to use that. So part of it is we're all guilty of caving into distractions and not maintaining focus. Focus is a huge part of deliberate practice. Um, I, I know I'm talking to I can tell you about this, but uh, I, I went, uh, I had a friend basically convince me to delete all my social media. So I did everything except I keep Facebook because I run a professional development group. But I would say now having not had like Snapchat or Twitter or TikTok or MySpace for like, I'm just kidding, uh, for, for over a year, it's definitely made a big impact on being able to maintain higher levels of focus. I'm not, like advocating or like pushing you like to delete all your social media because there's many wonderful things that come with that. But part of it is um, reducing task switching. So I have a twin sister, her name is Mimi. She is Dr. Brinberg and now she's going to be a professor at Ohio State in the fall. But she um, actually has done research in this idea of genomics, which is the way studying how humans interact with their screens. And she and the uh, advisor of hers with part, with part of some studies, I looked at task switching on laptops. Um, like they would, do, they would do screenshots of people's laptops and capture thousands and thousands and thousands of screenshots. And they found that people task switch, which includes like switching tabs or stuff, but that's every 15, 20 seconds on a laptop. That, I mean, that to me, that, that's it's probably even more so on a phone. So it's learning just how to find time and learning to sustain uh, long periods of focus. I go with that. So it doesn't get any easier, just telling you now, growing, 
starting to grow up myself and becoming an adult, not quite. Um, <laughs> like, it's, you, you do have more personal commitments coming to the mix, and I mean, just like that, all of our mentors that we have here, I think many of them are great, great examples of being able to live both sides of the point very well, the work, but also having full lives. So now's the time to develop and work these habits. And to be honest, this happens with me all the time, sports that you can go down to because Dr. Pearson talked about this. He's like, I, he's, he mentioned he doesn't like sports study. First time he said that, I said, you're kidding me. Like, how do you get to where you're at and not like sports study? He's like, well, when, when I tour study, when I'm back to tour study, I can always think about something else I can do. I have another email I can answer. I have another problem I need to get solved. I can walk out and talk to someone. So it's again finding this, creating a space to be able to source that effectively. I won't try to talk about that, but it's something that can easily go away with business. And again, I think I come up with the preconception that you need unbroken hours. Like even if you like score study for like I score study for 15 minutes and then switch to something else and go back to 15 minutes and switch to something else, you can get 30 minutes of great score study in. But you might be like, oh, I need a full hour to score study, and then that full hour is like, well, I can write an email, I can answer this text, oh, let me see, let me go on TikTok a little bit, and and then that probably turns into 10 minutes of score study with 15 minutes of other tasks switching thrown into the mix. So there's someone named has anyone, does anyone know the name Jason Hotheim? Kind of. Jason Hallheim has a very interesting story. He is a percussionist, grew up playing percussion, um, and went to Ball State for, I think, aquatic sciences or something. And uh, after graduated, and I think he double majored, like percussion performance, something science. He wound up getting a job as a research assistant in a research lab and worked that for about 10 to 11 years. And like, he probably still play percussion, was still active, but he wasn't a, a professional musician. And about, I don't know, 10 minutes into, not 10 minutes, 10 years into, <laughs> uh, yeah, 10 minutes into his job. No, about 10 years into his gig, he said he decided he wanted, he got um, hooked on deliberate practice. He got really into uh, Andre Erickson's research. He said, you know what, I'm going to apply this principle and I'm going to try to win professional to 50 games. So it took about five to seven years of a lot of practice and a lot of fail. Lots of failed auditions, but he wanted to win the job with the Metropolitan Orchestra, which is arguably the most competitive symphony job in the country. And this is someone who spent 10 years as a researcher. So he, I, I linked his blog here, but he, he writes a lot about deliberate practice. He actually has deliberate practice boot camps um, that he does with a horn player in the Met. A really good friend of mine, Walt Cooyer, who's, um, he just did his master's of Michigan on saxophone. He's, he's done lessons, just like Zoom lessons with Jason Hotline to just talk about deliberate practice. And he's like, he, he, he does a lot of what this guy does, and he's, I think, going to be, and I'm biased here, just because I like the guy, he's probably going to be like one of the greatest saxophonists ever done. Because he does this. So there are five elements that, that Jason Hotline talks about as part of the Honors Erickson research. So intentional design means basically that when you sit down to do something, you have clear goals on identifying weaknesses. Those aren't fun to set, right? It's not fun. It's, one, it's not fun to identify your weaknesses, and two, it's sure not fun to figure out how you're going to make it better because it's often a time it exposes more flaws along the way. But this is the most effective way that you can create, start creating flow, and start creating um, forward progress on something. I'll tell you one of my weaknesses um, in conducting is uh, time. Like when I'm watching on the sessions the last couple of days, I know it's like I have a lot of um, hiccups that the participants were having. So it's like, okay, I need to like be very intentional when I actually practice conducting. I'm going to focus on these things. I'm like, well, I don't want to focus on those things because I just want to be good already. But it's like, no, I have to do that. And it's like, well, I don't want it, so I don't do it. I don't get better, and then I get stuck in the same cycle of like, why am I not better? So, um, and some of that has to do again with objectivity, approaching ourselves and our craft objectively. It's so easy, especially in our field, to wrap everything about who we are into what we do. And that's really important in the moment when, you, when you're a performer. But it's also, when I talk to people, both performers, conductors, educators, 
is they actually have, I think they have an off switch. They have a time when they're like, okay, I'm not Isaac the conductor, I'm just Isaac the person, and I'm gonna go salsa dancing because that's my ass play. Or I'm gonna go garden, that's what I like to do. Um, Fabio Luisi, who is a big orchestral conductor, is actually a professional perfumer and like has like luxury perfume lines. And that's like his thing. He's like, I love perfumes, and I honestly I would want to do this more than actually conduct just like metropolitan opera. So all that to be said, um, it's important to be objective with that as well. And again, going into feedback loops, the idea of ways to objectively assess performance and conducting, of course, is this tape. I hate watching tape. Like I, I intentionally don't like really keep my tape very well organized. So I'm like, oh they're not organized, I'm not gonna go and really watch them. Um I found like I need them for job materials coming up this year, so I need to organize them. But and then or like listening to recordings for yourself, practicing or playing, like those are those are truth tellers, like looking in the mirror. So the, the more that you can take your um, your emotions out of the equation and just focus on okay, what am I doing? Oh hey, look, I'm, I'm moving really clearly in that section. Oh, didn't really show that crescendo the way I intended to. Or oh, I, I really missed that that important thing that's going on in the third clarinet. I should go back to the score and look and see. Oh, okay, wow, that's actually an intent line I didn't notice. Let me add that. So we we tend to be harder on ourselves than other people, right? And most of the time, our inner voice is probably harsher than if you were giving feedback to a student. So something I took away from the workshop that I'm going to apply to this week is when I need to give myself feedback, it's going to, I'm going to have like some of my favorite students I ever had when I was teaching and just be like, how am I giving this feedback to Caroline? How am I giving this feedback to um, Samit? How am I giving this feedback to, um, to Joey? So I want to be, I want to say it in the same voice. So that's something I'm just going to do as well. We talked a little about focus and concentration, just reducing your task, switching distraction. And uh, this one you all already have, just by being here, is that commitment and drive and intrinsic motivation. That relentless passion and pursuit of craft. Like, I had, a, I had a mentor of mine talked a lot about relentless passion. He said, Isaac, what are the two most important things that a conductor does? Inspire the ensemble and listen to them. And a lot of that comes from, and then again, he would like, he had like a little stone on his keychain and said inspired. So like, this is what I had with my like totem. So like if I'm having a bad day, I feel like crap, I had two hours of sleep, I just got back to doing this gig, I have to go in front of my ensemble, just look for that. And that's something that I think I believe can be practiced. Like to be honest, like I woke up this morning, like pretty worn down from the weekend. Um like okay, I have a lot of stuff to do for stuff today. I, my mind's in a few different places, but so you know what? Like you have to show up. And so much of it as well is, it's not an acting thing. I'm not, I'm not, hopefully I'm not putting on a like persona or performance, but part of it is just like being able to again turn on that switch and have that energy ready to go. Like my vocal up one point is like, oh, my voice is so tired. Oh, but I know I have to turn on my teacher voice. I have to be ready to present. So it's like you turn on that switch. So you, you learn how to balance your energy and throughout the day, especially when you teach, because teaching took me like, so then I remember my first year of teaching, I was tired all the time. Why was I tired all the time? That's because I was going 100 miles an hour all the time versus reading the room and finding the speed limits. So it's like, oh, I can go 60 this moment, this moment I can go 25. Anyway, that was a tangent. So the, all of this that we're talking about, the, the intentional design, feedback loops, concentration, commitment and drive, leads to what's called a sophisticated mental representation. This is the goal of any um, person who's an expert at what they do, whether it's an elite pole vaulter to the best curling team in the world to um, like the best clarinets. They, no matter what they do, have a very um, detailed idea of what it looks like to be the best at what that field is, to be the best DJ, to be the best person who makes flower bouquets. There, typically, every field has has something that's held up as like excellent, and no matter that field, that person who's creating that has a strong idea of what they want. Jackson Pollock had an idea of excellence. His idea of excellence was throwing paint on a canvas. Um, Martha Graham had an idea of excellence. It was about breaking old rules of classical ballet. So for us, our sophisticated mental representation is what. 
what does the ink on the page sound like in, in my head? Can I hear it as vividly as possible? And then how can I get the people in front of me to sound like the thing that's in my head? And that's, that's, that's the essence of story study. And rehearsal in so many ways. So as you can tell, the literary practice is pretty intense, right? So the nice thing is you can do it in short term, not term, chunks, short term chunks. So you can be more efficient. And then you can work with a quick feedback back loop so you can immediately know what's the next thing I would need to work on. And then, again, the goal is to have that vivid internalization, comprehension, and expression of the score ready to go. Now, that doesn't mean it's carved in stone. Hopefully, it's flexible. Hopefully, you get up and, like, if Matt's playing clarinet on the serenade, and Matt shapes a phrase differently than what I have in my head, I'm like, oh, Matt, I like the way you shape that. Let's go with that. Or same with Axel. If they're playing, and I'm like, oh, I like how Axel's following Matt's phrasing here, or vice versa, why don't we go with that? That's showing, okay, I have a strong idea of what I want, but it's flexible. Something I want to talk about with mental representation is for the longest time, I, I started going to conducting workshops when I was after I was my freshman year of college. I hadn't taken a lick of conducting before. I just like to stand up the front of the mirror and do it. So I got up on the podium, and who was the guy's clinician? Michael Haycock, director of dance at the University of Michigan. Now, he was very kind to me, um, understood kind of my background, but I remember the question I had for him, the other clinicians, was what does it sound, what does it feel like to have an oral image? head. And I wasn't really getting the answer I wanted. So for years I would ask, what does it mean to have an oral image in your head? Like, does that mean that if Lucy was studying the Shroud Serenade, that she would be able to hear, like, a Deutsch gramophone recording with both headphones and be like, I can hear it that clearly. That's what I thought it meant for the longest time. What I've gathered is it's more of an intuition and more of a feeling. Now you might be able to literally hear stuff. Like, I can hear I can hear the recap in my head that comes later and it's in the horns, and I can hear the color, the density, the balance, the articulation, the phrasing, dynamics, um, intonation that I want for that section. There are other sections that are more feeling based. Like this is this is the in the in the exposition, it's like ooh, da da di da da ooh, da da there's like 16 note triplets. I just feel as like tactilely these like dense, sticky tootsie rolls of notes. But I don't hear it as well. I just feel it. So I think for me, vivid internalization is both. It's a, it's feeling and it's it's actually hearing stuff. And if you can't hear stuff, that's fine. But if you know, it's like I know this is right. I know in my heart of hearts, this is how I want this phrase to go. Then you have a vivid internalization. I hope that helps because I know I, if someone told me that ten years ago, <laughs> I would have been on. A, I, I think I would have not had ten years of frustration. Any questions so far? Yeah, Hunter. So kind of going back to um, like the idea of task switching, um, I kind of noticed that like um, I can't remember his first name, but I like you am not on a first name basis with that man. Um, you said he would like go off and like do fifteen minutes of score study. Yeah. Um, is it just a matter of if you do do task switching, you have to be like more vigilant about it and just understand your tendencies? Yeah. Oh yeah, Mr. Um, Rikisi. Yeah. Like I think with that. Like, you can task switch in a sense, like, I'm going to work on this for 10 minutes, I'm going to work on this for 10 minutes, I'm going to work on this for 20 minutes. But within those 10 to 20 minutes, it, that is, like, the only thing that's getting your attention. Like, phone down, out of the way. So even just, like, going from this and then having this out here. I'm like, okay, I'm, like, going through and you go, boom. Or you, like, you, you break that whole stop. So I think it's fine to even go as small as, like, five minutes or, or shorter. As long as those five minutes are purely involved with the task at hand. Yeah. Yeah. I have a hard time stopping doing the task. Like, I like to sit down and do something from start to finish. Yeah. Because I have a really hard time walking away. Okay, yeah. Um, so, how do you suggest to break it up? Yeah. No, that's a great question. So, I mean, we'll get we'll get into this as we get into the piece, but um, part of it is you can be like, I, I, I'm going to sit down, and my goal is to work on this 16 bar phrase, or you can be like, today my goal is to identify all the moments uh, who has the melody throughout the piece, or I'm going to um, go and come up with my my phrase structure, 
like I'll do that like who has a bit more comments in the wall in my talking lesson. Like it's it's program it's a quasi programmatic narrative through composed keys. So there are like like Carlos stares at the river and becomes a bubble. Cool, I'm gonna learn the Carlos stares at the river river becomes a bubble section. Okay, this is the gate of power section. I'm gonna work on the first part where Carlos and Juan are leaping between boulders. So I just like break up this like mammoth 25 minute piece into these smaller chunks. And that way then you have that feeling of completion, but you know it's just one part rather than okay, I need to sit down and learn the shot serenade. Because you would sit there and hope probably not stand up until like the end of your career. <laughs> because that's there's so much in this piece. Good. Yeah, Lucy. On that note, I'm the type of person who doesn't like who likes to do things in one sitting because I know if I leave it, I'm not gonna want to come back to it. Yeah. Or I'm never gonna want to be in the mood to do it again. Yeah. No, that, that's a good question. You know, part of it is, and I know for me this was a, an important mindset shift as well, was the idea that, like, you know, and you've probably heard this before, like a lot of a lot of work is never done. Done. So that's where I think again, like like Hana, I think you come up with a you set you set a sub goal parameter that you feel good. Once I get this feel the sub like complete the sub goal parameter, then I know I, I can put a pin in it and come back. Um, and then I don't know if you incorporate maybe incorporate some review as well, like okay, I'm gonna put a pin into it here. I, I got this 16 measure phrase complete. I wanted to, I want to go on to the next 16, but I'm gonna start by reviewing the last eight. And then you just you create link chains rather than progress like this, which is like 16 bars, 16 bars, it can be 16 bars, 24 bars. Does that make sense? Yeah, Kim. Um, I would go to the part question, I guess. Oh, then I don't have a multi-part answer. <laughs> Great. Uh, so this like concept of like order and practice, yeah. like how long have you like been practicing this or like had it like in your mind for like this long? I've had it in my mind for a while. Um, most vividly since about 2019, um, since I really got to know my friend Walt. But uh, to be honest, I don't really practice a lot of what I preach yet. <laughs> I'm gonna do a lot more preaching than practicing, but um, I'm, I'm hoping this year to, to really implement it more practice wise. Um, I know, like, for example, something I want to implement because I'm still learning more than Walt for my lesson on Wednesday is I'm going to, I think, set those. Small mini goals for the for the back third of the piece. Like, okay, I'm going to take these 32 measures and I'm going to learn how to sing a composite rhythm because it's bump, bump, beep, ba -da -da, bump, 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 it's like all over the place. So I said, okay, what's the compound rhythm? Maybe I write it out, write out the composite rhythm on staff paper, sing it, look at the score, how does it line up? Cool. If I can get that done in 15 minutes, check. Put the score away for a second. Yeah. So for like these different songs, would you recommend doing like one song and then one song and two and three times and then come back to it? Or would you kind of like group it back together and just like have this time frame in mind for each song? You know, either or. Like um, John Wooden, longtime basketball coach, he even up until he had, like later in his career, he would put he would lesson plan basically every practice on an index card and have minutes break down. Four minutes, like four PM. Practice starts. Four like four four ten dribbling, four to four twenty-five, free throws, blah 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 blah. So we, um, that was something to consider. And then if you want to like, okay, I'm gonna do the exposition of Strap Serenade and this like hour chunk, or in like 30 minutes, I want to get through half of the exposition. So the first five minutes, I'm gonna just I start identifying uh, cadences, and then I'm gonna start identifying um, voices like melody, accompaniment, counter melody. A thematic material. Now I'm going to start doing some harmonic analysis of key moments that when I went through, I'm like, oh, okay, that's an interesting chord. Um, now I'm going to do a rhythmic analysis. Now I'm going to sing through the melody. Okay, cool. Half an hour, I made good progress on there. Now I might work on something else. Yeah, I think either way. Yes. When you were teaching your high school kids, um, did you ever like you were playing what grade four, grade five, music grade? Uh, I, I taught middle school, but yeah, we were doing like grade two, grade three. Yeah. Did you like? I feel like you know when I in my experience, I haven't needed to spend hours of score study on those, right? No, like, no. Did you ever spend more than an hour or two on those types of pieces? Well, 
Does it, or like, did, sorry, let me rephrase the action. How, how long did you spend on sports study before you had put it in front of the kids for the first time? Uh, it, would, it would depend. I mean, to be honest, there was some stuff where it's just like, okay, listen, listen through it a couple times because we just decided we need to start this piece. Cool, go. And then, which isn't best practice. I'll admit I've been very guilty of, of practicing least worst practice. Uh, I mean, there, there, there are times I'll happen. Um, there were, are things, though, when I was the source setting, especially for middle schools, would be more pedagogy focused. Like, okay, this um, this piece has this tricky syncopation rhythm, so for the warm up activity, we're going to use that rhythm right on the board, count it, clap it. Now we're going to play B5 major scale on that rhythm. Cool, everyone learned that. Awesome. Um, oh, horns have really awkward leaps here. Okay, what voice they're with? They're with the alto saxophone, go figure. So when we rehearse this section, we'll have altos and horns. Um, play it together, um, that type of stuff. Like I'll be studying more for concept and studying more for pitfalls. Or like, okay, Sarah does have a weird rhythm here. Oh, they, shoot, they haven't learned a rough yet. I need to go back and teach them what a rough is. That'd be cool. Good question. Yeah. Anything else for the meantime? Ready to plug along? Cool. So, um, one thing I do want to say is I believe score study is a non-linear process. I think oftentimes when we look at score studies, we look at um, lists of items for score study that can be numerical, like, okay, step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, I, I've come to learn, at least in my, my mind, that you stuff that happens later informs stuff you've already studied. So it's important to be more, I think of it more like a sandbox or like, a, like one of those like Skyrim or like a, like one of those free roaming worlds. Like, okay, I'm gonna free roam around the Strauss Serenade score. Okay, going through boop 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 boop. Oh, okay, okay. When when we have like this moment here, that that that, that was material that came back before. Oh wait, it's a different dynamic level this time. So that means it's probably it needs to be phrased a little differently. Oh, or Strauss for a different articulation here than it did here. So what does that mean? But if I just went through, okay, I learned the first 30 measures. Check, shell, next. I think that you lose those moments to move around. So um, it is important, though, to start with context. And I'm sure many of y'all are already probably pretty good at this. Like, okay, who's the composer? Um, if you're in my class, you do this already. Like, who's the composer? What's the piece about? Does the piece have lyrics? Like, um, reading program notes. Doesn't have to take super long amount of time, but it's like what what's driving that curiosity you learn more about the piece. So in the Strauss example, um, written in 1881, um, just composed it at 17. It was kind of the piece I got him on the map as a composer, um, created a connection with Hans von Bulow, and that led him to become a like get the conducting experience as well. Um, and it was really influenced by Mozart and Beethoven and cool. So that's already going to give us a lot of information that musically as well as we go along the way. And it follows a horn player. Cool. So that's a lot of context. Um, I also believe it's very important to listen to recordings um, because Dr. Pearson mentioned this as well this weekend. Like people, people listen to recordings and if they tell you they don't, they have their mind. <laughs> Um, and like this old school purist mentality about that, I think is a false narrative. However, uh, it's important to listen to multiple recordings. And chances are, most of the pieces you're going to work with are going to have multiple recordings. Now, if it, if it doesn't have a recording, like if you're, let's say, doing a commission, I'm um, just listening to other pieces by that composer. Just to have the composer's vocabulary and language start flowing in your mind. So when you get the premiere of that piece or start studying that piece without a recording, you already kind of know part of the, that composer's. Language and writing style. So the first thing I do, and if you have a copy of Strauss Serenade in front of you, great, or you can go look off someone. The first thing I do when I score study after, like I do a little bit of contextual stuff, which by the way I go back to, because as I study, I might something might come up, I go back to and go, huh, like that, that's something I didn't notice in my initial like looking at the piece or. Oh wait, what's this? What's this thing called a basset horn? Like, what, 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 what's this business about? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to start just doing past pieces of the score, 
I started listening to it, so maybe it's like, okay, I can start having a faint idea of what these notes sound like on stage. So here, here I am, I'm sta I guess I'm standing at home, um, and I'm just gonna like give you a little insight into this voice. So, like, I'm just noticing already, this being like in the first page, what are some things that you notice? Oh, what has a melody? Oh, what has a melody? Even though it's mostly used in rhythms. Yeah, so a more of a homophonic um, texture. What else? And this is truly sandbox mode. Like, this, I'm not fishing for any answers. There's like rhythmic compounding with the melody, like the bassoon. Um, mm. It all, all kind of follows the framework of the melody. Yeah. Something I'm noticing is the accents in measure five and six, and that's when the conch bassoon and the little horns come in. So I'm curious what those chords feel like. Like, oh, lower voices, a little bit of an accent. What type of accent are we going to maybe go for here? Is it going to be like a wide 50 yard line accent, or is it going to be like a, a denser, weightier accent? And oh, what am I doing? Developing gesture already. So that, that, that is me running, running up and down the sandbox right now. Okay, just looking around a little bit. Hmm, not really any new material. Ooh, some really good ones though. Yeah, some crunchy harmony there. Oh, we have a 16 bar phrase, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Anyone noticing in the second system? Go to the first page? Uh, second page. Second page, second system. Second page, second system. Unison rhythm. Yeah, unison rhythm. What am I going? Yeah, some of that as well, Lucy. Very good. Kind of the dynamic. Yeah. Something I noticed compared to the first time. So 17 is it's starting to restate the first theme. But in the first bassoon, instead of a B flat and measure 18 <laughs> corresponding to measure 2, there's a D flat. So now it becomes a slide chord. That's interesting. So that's now a moment of like surprise. So something different is happening. So this is, we have, we're, we're not going to go through a lot more, but that's like what I'm starting to do as I go through noticing. Now, I mean, I've been say like, I've studied the piece before, but I'm just starting to notice things. I'm like, oh, hmm. That's repeated material, how is it the same, how is it different? Um, oh, our letter A, we have new material. We have high fanfare motive. Um, and then I have to take it to 31. This looks like a new thematic idea. So this is probably like the second theme area. And so I would just go through and pass through. Honestly, the first time through, I'm probably not going this deep. I'm probably going, okay, what are the big sections? So I go beginning, and then um, oh, we have a tempo primo on page 10. So maybe that's a new section. It looks like maybe some sort of development. I think developing a lot of accidentals, applying a lot of different key areas. And then, oh, here on page, page 14, I've seen that material. That's the opening oboe melody in the horns. So that's probably some sort of recapitulation. So that's like pass through one. And then as, and I'm like, okay, I'm now just going to pass through the exposition. This goes into finding some sub goals. Okay, passing through the exposition it would be more of the detail that we were just talking about as well. And if you notice, we were asking more just, um, well, before that, this is where you would probably start finding out what analytical techniques that you, you need. Like, well, you don't necessarily need to do a harmonic analysis of this whole piece. That would be a little pedantic. But we already starting to identify moments of harmonic interest that if you know the, what, what's going on there harmonically, that I think that's going to help inform your phrasing. Or, like we mentioned, ooh, the tunes have like F flats and E double flats and all of that. That's probably going to be actually a rehearsal moment because they probably are going to see that and go, like, brain's not firing anymore. <laughs> double flats, that's not a thing. So that just is going to start performing your. Uh, analytical techniques. And what were, what were we doing this whole time? We we're asking questions. Why does composer do X? Why does composer do Y? Why does composer do Z? 
like a bridge. Like that's so much of what that noticing aspect is. If I'm not, I'm not really looking for answers, maybe a little bit with big picture stuff. So I'm more just interested in what questions are coming to light looking at this piece. So then, you know, through the noticing process, we're starting to get into internalization, which is that forging what we're noticing into an in, like a musical imagination, into, into what the, how this, all the noticing and, and local is connecting to this. So with this, like we can go ahead and stand up a little bit and move around. Because I'm going to show you all a little bit of what I do with my apartment when I was watching. Which is funny. <laughs> Oh, oh boo. Starting to build um, that whole image, we've been starting to notice some things. So something I'm going to do a little bit is, like, once I feel like I know how the melody goes, or I, I can, I'm able to sing a part. Like, I'm just going to start walk, literally walking around, like my apartment, just singing this to myself with it, like away from the score. So, I'm going to be like. So um, I'm just like starting to move into it. And, and, <laughs> and like literally just kind of like interpretive dance a little bit. So I'm noticing I didn't do a pattern. I'm not doing a board pattern. I'm just starting to figure out how how does this mu music, how does my body want to respond to this music in a, in a natural way. So if you want to close your eyes, you can. <laughs> But I just want you to, to move around. So first of all, I want to get you some space around them. Move around. We can, like, we can like not go in a circle. We can like yeah. spread out here so we don't hit each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah. So, like, move around. Yeah, right. Like, we're gonna crash, 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 crash. Yeah. Like, <laughs> down. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as you're listening, we'll probably do maybe the first like bars. I want you to start moving, and, and you don't have to use your arms necessarily. You can just be like, you maybe starting to breathe with the phrasing. And we'll listen to it a couple times to get a, a, some chances to become familiar with the. Here you go. idea and a response.
So that's, that's one bad theory. So now you maybe have a better idea of what the, what's going to come. Let's do it again. And if you weren't moving your arms, maybe try moving your arms. If you were, try some different things. Maybe now there's something you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to listen for that moment and see what my, how my arms want to move in that moment. Let's do it one more time. I, I, I'm not personally not really watching a lot just because I want you all to do your thing. Um, and, you know, I, I, reminded, <laughs> I realized that section was like, okay, this has a lot of formal momentum stuff. Bum, buddy. Hey, yaddy, yaddy. Hey. I grew up. I do that a lot. Like, I, it, it grew. D A do fi even the slow music has a groove. So do it one more time. And now I want you to maybe start, if you feel comfortable, start exploring a little bit of like how do I want to shape the phrase a little bit. This is also a great way to practice and build gestural vocabulary. If you notice watching or participants, some of them have like their moves. Like they have a move that they like, oh, I practice this one, it feels good. <laughs> and I'm gonna use it. So it's like, okay, I'll come up with another way of showing it. Uh... <laughs> so you, this is about building gestural vocabulary as well. And I, I think about the space around, I know this is a little bit off topic, but I think about the space around me just as a, as a spherical membrane. So then like, like I, I can go up here, I can go down here. <laughs> I can ask to be quiet, um, but then when I get into like conducting world and in front of me, and it's like okay, I've explored all this space. Now this space feels a lot more manageable, and I can just literally, I'm just pulling string, pulling taffy, just having fun, shaking the clay. <laughs> just because all of these movements are now going to become like that type of gesture, or that type of gesture. Now I'm going to take a segment of all this movement energy. Anywho, one more time. <laughs> See so you can come up with some different gestures. So that's like, that's like, to me, that's where, that's what I love doing most. Like, sitting down and looking at a score, man. Um, <laughs> like, getting up and trying to breathe with the music, trying to embody the music. Like, this is very nice, gentle music, right? Now, there's other moments that are a lot more, like, big, heroic, or stuff. So I'm, like, oh, I'm just going to have a moment. Oh, perfect. So if I was like listening to this section, like I'm trying to figure out my economy of space. I know the big moment's coming up soon. 
I am walking around my apartment. And horns. And so like that, that's my point with that. So that, that goes into that aspect of, of internalization. I'm recording myself singing and playing it. So like, okay, I'm not gonna sing that opening oh, oh, oh. You record on my voice memo. Okay, I want to go there, play back. Oh, I'm singing it like the state of Illinois, nice and flat. <laughs> so, so I need to change my approach. Um, that's or recording yourself like, okay, I'm gonna conduct through some gestures I want to try to show this. Oh, that wasn't very clear, or oh, I, I don't understand what I'm trying to show here. So, like, and that's, I mean, what we did took what, like a few minutes? Recording yourself singing a four measure phrase takes 30 seconds. Like, just mathematically, you're getting way more information, like, information calories, if you will, um, per second of study rather than you, okay, time to do our harmonic analysis of Strauss. One chord. <laughs> like that, like that's that's it can be fantastic. Anyway, go ahead and have a seat again. And I will say as well, this goes into the mental representation aspect. Your mind can only really like conduct what yes, 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 please get donuts, all that. That was a nice little break along the way. But your mind can only really like conduct what your musical mind can imagine. So, I mean, if you, I'm sure many of you are like avid listeners of many different things. Um, Tim Lohman had a great quote. Um, he was a master student here for my first year. Um, and he said, I've only heard all the music I've ever heard, which I'm like, Tim, yes. That is. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about it, and I'm like, he's right. I've only heard all the music I've ever, ever heard. So if I'm listening to a composer I've never heard of, there's no way I can, I can possibly really study their score like authentically and wholly, like W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly, um, without, like, I haven't heard in your music before. Or, oh, we're doing a, we're doing a major Ferguson chart with, uh, with Jack Van One this year. Okay, I haven't heard any major Ferguson before, so maybe it sounds like Count Basie. Nope. <laughs> um, so again, okay, listen to me first. So that's just again a, a little PA about always, always be listening to many different types of music. So I spend a lot of time, I think, flipping between the first three. Like the first three, I'm like context notes and context internalization notes and context. I like I flip around a lot between those three. But then all this goes towards preparation. What we just did is preparation. It might feel a little bit just like goofy, but like I'm sure some of you were like, okay, oh, I found a way, I found a way I'd like to show an arrival. Hey, right? well, now you're already preparing your conductor. Or, huh, I noticed that um, the recording sped up on the second time the, the theme went back. Huh, that's actually a cool interpretation thing. Now I'm preparing my interpretation, I'm doing a little score study as well. So, um, just like I think what, uh, what Renan had asked about um, doing that, like score study at the secondary level, I think in multiple high school band, orchestra, choir, I mean, the, you'll probably be focused more on the pedagogy. Now, there are, of course, things you want to probably teach your students about form. I mean, the classic example, the band world is teaching a march. But in a march, um, is a really great teaching tool because it has it has a pretty clear formula. At least at least like Sousa and later marches have like have the Sousa form, but there's also like regimental march form and other forms. So then you can say, okay, let's start at the break strain instead of let's start at reversal E, or let's go first strain second time, rather than let's start at measure time. So um, those are some again, conceptual things that you would want to teach. Or that you would want to consider in your score study, with again, you know, form, all that, and then part of it as well is structuring and planning the rehearsal cycle. Like, okay, okay, you read through the piece, or you're looking through the piece, and you're probably identifying, okay, these measures are hard for this instrument, 
These measures are hard for this instrument. Dionysiac is hard to declare an S period. <laughs> like, what? Never. So in, in your uh, score study, you probably you might make notes. Do like like sectional question mark? Or um, or you might start coming up with um, solutions. So um, alligator alley. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is the, you were? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. So alligator alley has a lot of meter changes, right? So you know, it's at your score study, you get really solid what you're conducting. So then you might go, okay, like, here we go. I want you to just count um, eight notes for me. Ready? And. And you just have to do that and try, okay, like, look at the first four measures, and they go, oh my gosh, it's the same year. So, <laughs> so, so then that can help inform the teaching as well with that. And again, all of this sandbox goes towards realization. And realization isn't like crossing the finish line of marathons. It's just not a singular objective saying, I've completed my score study and I have a full realization of the Strauss therapy. Um, because I'm, so I'm doing this piece um, with Wind Symphony on our chamber cycle after 88, which is going to be very fun. I was supposed to do this piece March 2020. <laughs> so, and, but as I started digging into this, I was studying it really intensely back in 2020. I had like five rehearsals on it with two players. Then we get to do the show. When I go back to this, after I listen to 20 different recordings, after I do all my dancing, after I sing through it, and I might go, huh, oh, actually, I, I feel like I want to take a faster tempo than I did back in 2020, or I actually want to focus on this line more. It's not like I'm going to go back and remember how I had it in March 2020 and just do that. If that was the case, the art would be dead. And we are a living, recreative art form. And as conductors, you all are part of the equation. Sure, we're here to be a, uh, a, a voice and an advocate for the composer, but we're also a, a voice unto ourselves. And you, as a musician, have the right to your voice, and you get to share that voice with the world. So just something to consider with that realization. And something, again, I know many of y'all are in conducting classes right now. So maybe have you considered practicing, conducting, or rehearsing to the score without a recording? I'm sure you do, I'm sure you sing as well. Or maybe you record yourself singing through like your, let's say some of your Dr. Mrs. class or my class. I'm gonna sing through it, conduct it, and I'm gonna watch it back with the sound on and the sound off. So if I'm singing that, I might be singing Chester. E -da -da -e -e -e. Like, okay, I want to crescendo the measure too. You try singing it beautifully because you're a wonderful musician. And then what, what does your conducting look like? And now you saw that a lot this weekend, right? You saw a lot of players where, like people get up, okay, sing that line, they sing it really beautifully, now conduct it, and <laughs> it ain't congruent. Uh, when I had my lesson last week with Dr. Pierce and I did Hull's first week, Chacon. He, we spent about 15 minutes on the first eight measures because he's like, you're singing it differently than you're conducting it. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it's something to struggle with as well. But something actually I like to go to is after I like study a piece and um, I feel a little more comfortable with it, I feel like, okay, I can, like, like I, my goal is, and I, I did a whole prepare for my lesson. I just walked around. I literally just, like, here's my apartment. I was only like, walking through my apartment conducting Holt's first suite, just seeing it. You know, you think, right? I know the piece pretty well, but I was just really doing this hard lesson. Like, that's how I studied my lesson this week. That's not quite what I studied for straps, to be honest. But now when I go back and, and listen to Strauss recordings, I'm trying to listen and be like, oh, there's some stuff, I, I don't like their tempo. I think that's, that's baloney, like that's too slow, or that's too fast, or why did they play this, or like they have zero phrasing here. Or, so then now, now I have a better clear idea of what I want, because I'm able to compare what I want compared to what other people presented. Uh, my mom once said, and she got this from my dad, that knowledge is the knowledge of differences. 
And my mom, when she, um, like when we were growing up, would say that. She would say, knowledge, like me and I, knowledge is the knowledge of differences. And I said, what do those words mean? And I finally like learned, like, because my sister's much smarter than me. Um, I, I finally realized what she meant is that when you are able to understand the differences between two items, then that's where the knowledge lies. So if you are, and this happens again, like if you have alligator alley in your head, you're doing loop with your band, or you're doing loops of room K with your choir, and you have a tiny one in your head, and they play that first note, and then it's like, Okay, what does the count mean? White, not short. Cool. Okay, let's all sit the Okay, let's now play it. Lighter? Good, that's better. That's closer to what, what we want. That's knowledge of differences. And that's really, again, what all what score study creates that vivid internalization, that strong enough representation, and all rehearsal is is getting what's outside your mental representation to be aligned with your mental representation. While having your mental representation be open and available to feedback from the players and be willing to change, it's a, it's dyadic. That's what my sister studies. My sister is literally an expert on dyadic AM analysis. And the more I thought, I learned about her research and what she does, I'm like, that's what we are. It's, it's dyadic. It's not a you, me, it's we, us. So, um, if you will. So, again, what, what, how you can implement all of this, hopefully, and we might, we have, I think we have time that we can do a little bit of straddles and then have some Q&A, but, um, like, do what you're doing in conducting class, right? Find, find a, like, okay, I'm, I'm going to use this half of my rotation Dr. Business class, and I'm, I'm going to try singing through it and being able to, just to dance to it. Or uh, I need to prepare this for Dr. Mrs. class. I'm going to first start by just what's the form? Cool, got that. Okay, now where's the melody all the time? Mark that. Cool. Um, that's a cool chord. Let me analyze that chord. Cool. Now let me get ready to go through, and after I've done that stuff, be able to sing through it. So that's the way that you can again um, implement all this in short segments and record yourself. Again, we <laughs> it's not fun to do. I don't like doing it myself, but it is like 100% the most time cost effective way to get better at whatever you want to do. Um, why, why, why do you think the best like, athletes in the world have all those slow motion cameras and they're literally looking, how am I getting off the runner's block? And they will practice getting off the runner's block. Okay, I need to move my leg this way. Okay, cool. I'm going to practice that. Record yourself. Nope, didn't get it. Record yourself. Nope, didn't get it. Oh, got it that time. Got it that time. Didn't get it that time. And then constantly, like, that's why watching tape for, like, athletes is, like, where you learn and distinguishes good from the goats. Or the sheep. One, or the, the, I don't know, Rams. Who won the Super Bowl? Look at that three word association. A plus plus me. So, um, being objective, again, is, is the, the crucial aspect of this, is that deliberate practice. It's just it's short duration, but intense focus concentration that does, you are not beating yourself up with. And that's I mean, that's a huge part of it. So like if we want to get, let's go back to the music for a second. Um, those are just some of the readings. Anders Ericsson, Tommy Port is where I learned a lot about focusing. Hannes Sterner is a piano tuner. And then Frank Petisi, that book is a great summation of the laws of philosophy. So let's go a little bit at uh, the Pioni Moscow 31. And I want you to take, um, take up 31, the Piana Mosca where the clarinet solo is. And I want you to take up until rehearsal C. And I want you to just do a little bit of noticing first. And then actually it's with the people around you. Start having a little bit of conversation about what you're noticing. And again, noticing is harmonies, it's melody, it's it's Texture, it's rhythm, it's orchestration, it's phrasing, it's dynamics, articulation, it's all those elements. It, it could be, like, if you know the piece, um, like moves. Okay, 
pam pi. There's the key, Isaac. Pi ya di da di da di da yam pam pa pam pi da 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 pam pi za da di da di da pam pa du pa pa pi da da du pa pa pi da da du pa pa pi da di da pam or whatever. So talk it out for a little bit. Push people around here. I want you to know this. So you have 31, which is the Kiwan Matsu, up until letter C. Yeah. So it's kind of like setting it up. Yeah. So it's also interesting because basically it's six bass in there, right? 
Uh, some sort of this. No. Oh, it, it, it might be it. in the cornets and the, the three. Yeah, the, yeah, in the four. It's on one in three, if you will. That one for one in four. For big B one, big B two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This sound like this sound might just be in Dubol cell for that comp like for the one and two, but you do have it out of that compound subdivision. And then I'll be good. Yeah, we see. Thinking, we were looking at sections A and B. Yeah. Um, a bit contrast I noticed there. Uh, section A, right when the solo starts, the dynamic functions are they're weirdly parallel to each other, but have some specific differences. Yeah. That first portion of the solo crescendo, diminuendo, diminuendo, yeah. diminuendo, then again, happy, happy. Yeah. But the second time this is stated at B with a thicker texture, yeah. that um becomes crescendo and then full measure diminuendo. It doesn't have the two. Yeah, and that's where it both times and does. Like, hold on. Oh. I think that's really interesting with that. Yeah. It's a specific difference. Thank you. I, I didn't notice that before. Okay, you teach me something. Yeah, Mariano. Um, so, like, the thing we were talking about mostly is like the, like the growth and decline of like, kind of like dynamics. Because, like, you know, I saw a lot of like the crescendos and decrescendos mostly almost happen like within one bar of each other. Yeah. So like it's just important to like use as much mo as much motion to convey that because four before C it's like fortissimo, but then when you get to C it quickly goes to piano. Yeah. So like you don't want to like basically like each block of sound in the piano. You know, so like it's like important to have like peaks and valleys within it. Mm. Yeah, I see. Very good. Yeah. Bounce, yeah. Uh, bouncing off of the whole um, idea of like swelling. Um, another thing that could be very beneficial in conveying that is I utilizing at least like what the thing is six out of me is the contour of the flute line. Mm. Just noticing that some of the swelling goes along with that and where it, there kind of seems to be disconnect you could kind of yeah. play around with where the climax of the swell is. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of building on Lucy's comment of like um, uh, textures and how thick and thin it gets. I feel like all these different sections are like Strauss kind of like as these like sort of breaks in texture before sort of like building it up again and then yeah. breaking it down and building it up. Good. So and especially kind of like I noticed like A going into B kind of has like kind of just has like I don't necessarily want to say dense texture but like kind of has like an average texture in the context of the rest of the piece. Yeah. But then he has like these two bars before B that almost seem like a fill in a way. Well B is the first time the way I'm looking at it, B is the first time that you have, like, it's the first time there are so many instruments playing, and they're yeah. all playing consistently. Because otherwise, like, if you look on page three, while well, yes, you have the same number of instruments in the score, there's rest here and there for other yeah. instruments. Like, B is the first time, especially in the 40, where basically everybody's playing, and you've got the clarinet with the melody a third below the flute. Yeah. So, change the texture by. In, in, Tell you something about the size of the canvas you want to use. Are you conducting four players or are you conducting all 13? So, all those things you're talking about are noticing. And to me, that's like the thing that gets me really energized and enthusiastic about what we get to do. And whether it's you're studying Alligator Alley, whether you're studying uh, the Red Balloon or Thomas Shenandoah, Chen Yi Dragon Rhyme, or um, the Joe Long Picture for Wind Symphony, like hopefully there are you can find those nuggets and what, what makes this music special. Because when you feel like that you have things that you're excited to talk about, then you talk about that with your students, then they might get really excited about it. And then that, then that makes enthusiasm just even come across more that way. So then the next stage, again, you know, you might be noticing something is as you start thinking about the phrasing we were talking about, or uh, texture, orchestration, density, start singing. Start moving like when you all were talking about certain sections, like the flute line. I'm not, if I was conducting the flute line in that section, then I want to like focus on the flute players here. I'm going to conduct them differently than if I was conducting students or, or I'm doing a foreign sustain. All, all that plays into your gestures. One to actually, um. I think in conclusion, before we go into the, the Q and A, like hopefully one one message I'm, I'm conveying to you all is to maintain curiosity. 
You know, I think curiosity is what makes us human, allowing us to ask questions. Like the ability to, to, to wrestle with new perspectives <laughs> and to realize that if you have all the answers, why are we in school? <laughs> you know, you can spend, spend your money elsewhere. So I, I hope, again, with this idea of deliberate practice, it, it provides an efficient model for how to source study, but it hope, hopefully provides a little bit of like we need to also remind ourselves that we want to think inspires others, but we ourselves can be inspired by our curiosity. So with that, are there questions? We can do the general Q and A. Anyone else? Yes or not? Can you? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Since you've been studying the score, can you explain the chord progression to me? Because this is driving me nuts. It's going from like a major two to a five to a major two again. Where is this? Measure 40? Or I guess really letter B? Letter B starts on a five chord in E flat. Um, letter B is, this is, so again, if you think about your sonata form, um, this is exposition second theme in a major key in sonata form. What uh, key area will that second theme? So in, in sonata form, in an exposition, in a two-themed exposition, the second theme after the transition is typically in what key? In a, in a major key oh, sonata. Okay. Yeah, Lucy. The dominant. The dominant. So it's actually one going yeah. to a. Yeah, if it's just a little predominant, yeah, you have a one, one six to a probably what seems like a two. So one to. Two six five actually, to a five back to one. So yeah, it's a little tonic predominant tonic, tonic predominant dominant tonic action. Here. And part of it is what we mentioned in the context part. Who was Strauss was influenced by Mozart and Beethoven very early in his career, so probably drawing on classical form as well. Yeah, Lucy, what's the question? So I noticed you mentioned that you did salsa dancing with Lucy. Yeah. Um, would you consider yourself a dancer? I and mean, does this inform your study of like creative movement? Or yeah, movement? I'm so glad you brought that up. So <laughs> I uh, I started salsa dancing when I taught as a Wednesday nights in South Bend at Vegetable Buddies, which is a blues bar in town. It's awesome. <laughs> Just started going. Uh, was really bad at it for so long. Kind of bad at it, but. Like one thing that like Dancy Ray really taught me about interpersonal communication is no one wants to read your mind, no one wants no one to read anyone's mind. And body language accounts for more communication than time. If, if you're really listening. Listening, I just read a book. Um, I actually very much recommend this book called You're Not Listening by Kate Murphy. I maybe send that to you, Kira, so you can push it out. I just finished reading it, made me realize I'm not a great listener. And I thought I was. I realized. One, I wasn't listening so much to understand, I was listening to respond. But I wasn't listening as much to someone's tone. Like when I asked Jen, um, like, how's your day? She's like, fine. I'm like, okay, something happened. Like, well, what happened today? Well, this happened. How was that meeting? It was stressful. Okay, what happened? I, if I just went, if I just heard fine and just went, oh, okay, that's great. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, <laughs> yeah, then, then I'm not really listening. So, uh, oh, yeah, back to salsa dancing. So, um, <laughs> so I, when I went to uh, UMKC, they have a phenomenal dance studio. And my very first year, they did a production of Stravinsky's Soldier's Tale, fully staged, with actors, dancers representing each character, a whole dance company, costumes. Like, I was, I was just like this all the time. Like, like, where am I? This place is awesome. And I got to meet some dancers and, like, talk with them. Like, hey, it looks like Kalina Coffee. Can I show you some conductions they need one? And they were like, you're not connected to your breath. And like, how can you tell? I was like, well, this luxury locked up. I'm like, it's how do you unlock it? Like, how do you, like, I mean, like, so, so I just, and, and my teacher at the time, mentor at the time, was really in, in uh, for my dance. And he's six, seven. I always study with tall people, apparently. So I, so, you know, in lessons, he would be, he would have me move, or like, uh, Seminar and he would conduct a lot like this. And I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I just learned, I just did that a lot. I was walking around, like brush my teeth. Not not brush, well, I would brush my teeth and, like, you know, if you brush my teeth and doing this, so I'll brush my teeth, or 
be doing this while I'm waiting for my uh, uh, TV dinner to finish cooking. Like, <laughs> feel like you got to eat, like, I don't know. Like, that's, so that, that has always been interesting to me. The idea of a movement, an African movement in a structured way, like in salsa or uh, bachata or reggae. Yeah. I encourage everyone to, to dance. Things very human thing to do, and you don't have to be like good at it, but if you just enjoy it, and then it gets, it gets you used to being in your space and taking that space. And like people in MI know me, I dance on the sidelines a lot, mostly to entertain myself, but like, but now I'm now I'm used to moving my body and I feel comfortable. So then when I do this, like I, I've explored that. Yeah, I don't know. Hello. Um, I was so in regards to like teaching. And yeah. doing score study and things like that, like how much time do you dedicate to that versus like lesson planning and like everything else that a teacher has to do? Well, score study is lesson planning in, in many ways. Um, you get through reading the Yorkshire, Yorkshire Battle, let's say, James Barr. Um, not easy horn parts. Um, and the first half of the piece is basically woman and horn, the second half of the piece has a brass fanfare, and then everyone comes in. Uh, kind of like Chester. So, if, um, when I was lesson planning, oh, I'm mean, ready to have woodwind stuff. Okay, how do I keep the brass players engaged? Okay, brass players, simple eighth notes. And that's how you get, like, that, that tour study involves the lesson planning. I know, I think, Renan, you were asking this earlier as well. I can't quantify it. Again, like, you, you, you're studying music on your instrument and ensembles at a, at a pretty high level. And then if you go out and teach and you teach hammer music, chances are you're like, okay, I can I learn this piece, I know how the piece goes pretty fast. But then it's taking into those bigger considerations like why why am I why can't I just do player play measure? Oh, it's because there's this really hard finger um, combination that the student that could code it and realize so okay, here's the fingerings, here's alternate fingerings, here's how you get better at it. Um, to the student. So again, it's it's looking at these different filters as well. Good, what else? Yeah, Mariano. I think with like you talked about this, especially with like multimedia and like especially with dance and stuff. So like so like for like example with the serenade, you mentioned that like you would like change how you think of and how it would stylistic uh, aspects of uh, into it. Yeah. And, like when do you think it's like a good time to like incorporate other elements of art to like accentuate that, especially since like conducting is such like a change, like it changes over time, you know, yeah. Are are you talking about incorporating multimedia like in the way you source study or in the way that you practice conducting? Hmm. That's a good question. Um when I when I had my comp exam or my master's, um my, my major professor, it's four hours of questions. So it's like, okay, it's two thirty, sit down, you have four hours to answer eight questions, and he made me handwrite it. So that was fun. But one of the questions was there are 10 pieces of music, like Schoenberg theme variations, Bernard Grand Ceremonial, um, other random, uh, oh, Mozart's C minor serenade. Name an artist that the music sounds like and why. And I went, oh shoot, thank goodness I know a little bit of art history. But like in this case, like that opening, I hear, like I can see a like 1830s, like Hudson School painting in my mind. On that is very idyllic, it's very pastoral. Um, it's warm, golden glow, because that, that was a very signature part of that park movement. So then when I get ready to conduct that opening, it might not be like I'm like, what does it feel like to be in a meadow when it's really warm, glowing evening sun? And then that, that feeling that I'm taking from a different medium, I'm trying to translate that feeling into, into my gesture because it's congruent to what's happening musically. Now that's like a lot more, if you think about Bloom's taxonomy, that's very higher order thinking. Uh, with younger students, you have to be more concrete and you have to scaffold. So I can't say, play that like you're in the meadow, because they're gonna go, how do I make a sound on my oboe read that makes it sound like I'm like walking through a meadow? <laughs> now you can say, okay, play that song. Okay, use more decimal error. Now make sure you're still supporting the read. Now don't don't blow 60 mile an hour error. 
Um, now use a lot lighter tongue, and then you can get them the technique down to like technique, not technique down, but technique to that. And like you know, how, that sounds really gentle. It's like you're going through a meadow, and they go, oh. And then like play out as you're in a meadow, they go what? So you have to make sure it's age appropriate as well, and developmentally appropriate for where they are in their skill level as well. Good, excellent question. What else? Yo. For those of us who are like checklist schedule, like color coded Google Docs, hey. how do we like? <laughs> how do we include that? Like, get that fifteen minutes of something in where you can get it and still feel like we're accomplishing something and not just like constantly go. I, I'm a time. I I was a time blocker as well. Um, when you time block your days, does it ever go according to plan? Hell no. No. And what was it Dwight Eisenhower said? Um, like plan plans are useless, but planning is everything. So if you just plan your day, and then let's say a day like a thing goes haywire, and you're sitting up in the lobby up here, you're sitting in in student lounge at HPD, and you're like, okay, I random twenty minutes open up this now. Okay, wait, this is the perfect time to go study for my production rotation. So I have a tour on me. Cool. Oh my, sit down and then try to pick up where you left off. That's something that Mr. Batisi did. He literally just was like, okay, I can do the 10 measures in 10 minutes, put it away, and then he had this ability to just pick up exactly where he left off. Now, to me, I, I can't really operate that way. So that's why, like with Lucy, I incorporate that element of um, let me go back and review a little bit so I can kind of get a running start into the new material rather than just crash into the new material. I think oftentimes we forget to review, and repetition is, where, is how we learn. You know, no, no one's able to just look at it once and say, I got it. Um, you know, especially if it's something that's a new concept or a little bit outside your zone of proximal development. For another ed term out there. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would do incorporate some review and just. Be open and available to the moment occurring and the opportunity presenting itself. Yes, Lucy. You speak a lot about mindfully going about your plans and going through, you know, having to be mindful. Yeah. Are there ever times where you just let yourself kind of be mindless and just go? And in, in what way? Um, I guess in like. Maybe not like in a school setting, but like in just your life, and as a teacher or as conductor or as a person planning your life. Yeah. And I just not, I just go about my way. Yeah. Every day. Last hour and a half. <laughs> I, I I mean I, I knew I wanted to talk about, but I like around halfway through an hour, like forty five minutes in, I can sense so the energy in the room kind of, okay, everyone needs to stand up. Okay, let's, let's do that thing I kind of have in the back pocket. I realized that for me, like, rehearsing and lesson planning is more about having all the pieces of the puzzle laid out, and then like, you get used to this, being able to be like, okay, now it's time to do that. Now it feels about right to do this. It wasn't like, I'm one, at 45 minutes in, I'm going to move to the next activity. It just it became, a, became a sensory thing. For me, I think in terms of life, um, it was, it was, you know, my third year of teaching, I was, I was thinking about graduate school, but wasn't quite sure. So there was a, I had a real distinct option of staying, but and I was in a great situation. And because most of my life has been like, I'm going to go to undergrad, go teach, go to get my master's, go get my DMA, and become a college band director. But now it's like, oh, I could go back and teach secondary school, I could become a college band director, I could do you athletic know, bands, I could do concert bands, I could just hope they be in form. <laughs> so, so now at the end of it, I'm allowing, I'm just allowing myself to less internal planning, more external listening, just kind of see what opportunities present themselves. I know someone asked me this um, when I was on Militant recently, uh, working with my friend Tori Band, and they and I was talking about that, and I said something which I told myself earlier was to be less. Myopic with my tasks. What's that word mean? Myopic? Yeah. Very, very, very narrow bandwidth. Okay. Yeah, what else? I got I got a little bit more time yet. Yeah. Um, on the note of not being myopic, I tend to be the type of person when I'm studying a score or playing a piece of music that I focus on the cells. Yeah. Organs and all those yeah. parts of it. Yeah. But I struggle with 
hope it has to be bigger and broader next year. Yeah. Like long line phrasing. Yeah. Too many advice folks on this. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go, everyone, to the trout. And I want us to. Let's, let's, let's go. I, I like going to the end of the book. Um, let's do. Actually, then one five. What's a good spot for this? Oh, perfect. Um, let's go at the Piwani Mopso, page 11. So this is a part of the development. Um, you know, the development provided a couple of key areas, and if you're already looking and noticing, it's a basically a four measure, five measure phrase that gets repeated a couple of times in a couple of different key areas. So something that now I'm thinking about is well, how do I pace all that development and material all the way until the tempo screen on page 14, which is the, the arrival. So now I have a known, I have two known endpoints. I have a known starting point, the PI Mato, and I have a known endpoint for TC Um And we have, what, 24 measures or so of material. So it's like, how am I going to shape the mountain range phrase wise? Am I going to start here, go up, I'll go back down here, go up, I'll then go a little, and go up, and go up, and go build, boom. So um, something we haven't talked about is. People might do like energy maps, or um, they might do a lot of their score study by just creating graphs, or by literally on graph paper writing, okay, that's just one through 16, melody, harmony, rhythm, orchestration. Then there's stuff out there, like especially for TC is big on being very um, specific in that way. So maybe doing like a dynamic chart, where you chart all the dynamics and then you connect the dots, and then you can see kind of the, the peak and flow of the energy that way. Allows you to zoom out, but still have a visual. When you're doing that and looking through a music, yeah. are you like reading notes? Are you like just looking at contours of others? Yeah, I'm looking more at contours, groups of notes, um, grouping those gestures like the tune song. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plus an eight note beat of gesture. So I'm just looking at that, I'm literally just looking at the contours of and seeing the, the, the line ascend. Now that's important. My phrase. Yeah, great question. Yeah, Kate. I just want to respond to that and say this weekend they did a lot of work on that first movement of the whole. Yeah. And that, like, the biggest problem for having was growing too big too soon in mm -hmm. that last half of the first movement. So that's like a really great thing to look at, too, because that's like a big chunk of music. And it's the challenging part of it is don't get too big. Yeah. So that's like another good thing that I've. Been a lot about. Yeah, absolutely. And then in that, of course, in that moment, the, the pedal, uh, the pedal part of the chaconne, like all of that is going to inform your gesture. Give me your one, two, zam, bam, di da, di da, bing, bam. So I just would even start by just like practicing what does it feel like to go from this side to this side over that period of time, and then tap. While doing that, now you might not literally show this because there might be other things I can bring out, and then meter. I think, again, when you, this shifts to conducting, but uh, so I went from a mentor to an intermediary step where it's like if you're working on the left hand gesture and you start doing it with the right hand and it's all going along, start by just tapping the beat with your right hand, with just the index finger. So you're used to feeling the pulse while you're doing this. And that takes away a variable of actually thinking about the mirror and, and the baton technique as well. Something about deliberate practice as well is about mirroring your variables. So you're only focusing on one or two variables at a time. And then incorporating those into synthesizing those into a larger aggregate. <laughs> good. I think I probably have time for maybe one more question before I got to split and meet the good kernel. <laughs> yeah, sir. As someone in pre-service education, I kind of feel like I need to sort of widen the like the number of pieces I know. How would you kind of like approach 
score study as like a producer of this goose, when I go about like just finding as many different pieces of music as possible, just studying as much as I can before getting in front of the ensemble. Yeah. Now I can I can share this all with you because I have it all on my my Google Drive. Um, uh, it's, it's starting to go through the list of a repertoire like F, uh, Florida Band Match Association has a really big list. UIL of course is a very well known list. Um, Indiana State School Music Association has a really big list. I'm sure Illinois has their list. It's starting to find words that are considered the best of each grade level. Like what is what are the grade one like besties? What are grade two goodies? What are grade three like? Excellent pieces, and thankfully there's a lot of reporting out there, and just starting to get people familiar with like what are considered the, the good pieces. And the, the blessing that you have here in Illinois is that we have the most extensive band library in the country. And we all know Jeremy; he's a sweetie. <laughs> I'm sure, like he and the librarian would be willing to, to help you out, maybe copy the score, or let you. I think there's actually a rental procedure. For students for the same library. So that was right there. And I wouldn't I wouldn't learn the piece with like I need to study the piece all the time. I would just become familiar with broad strokes. So you're like, okay, I know how like trying to play simple gifts go. So you're like, hey, I have a band that can play trying to play simple gifts. You're already familiar with the piece. And you also know the first movement is very exposed and you need a really rocking clarinet player. So it does fall apart. All right. I have a question. Like on the list. Like, yeah. That score, did you buy it that way or did you have it printed? If you did, you have any like. Oh, I, I, I had this printed. <laughs> um, and this was, this was for my master's, and we had a we had a contract. Since we didn't have librarians, and I and TA was one of the librarians, um, we had a contract with a, like a print service. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering, like, if I can get something in front of you, like the advocate cover thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I don't know where to get these. I'm sure like office supplies, depot, mass, whatever they call it. Um, all right, thank you all.